Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Corbett, Assemblymember Tarico's desk. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the very sobering presentation. Uh, this is a question for the uh, controller. I want to go back to the cash shortage problem. Uh, Mr. Chung, can you give us some real world examples of how individual Californians might feel the impact of our current state, or our impending, I should say, cash shortage in the state? Uh, th that's a complicated issue. The, uh, it depends on the timing. Uh, when in a particular month we run out of money. Uh, obviously payments are made at certain points in uh, time. Uh, so if you're, if you're at the, well the examples that we're talking about is that we are going to run out of money in March in the event the legislature and governor choose to take no action uh, with the rapidly deterioration that might happen actually, actually uh, earlier in February. But if we run out of money in mid-March and we have to issue IOUs, uh, th what would happen is we would queue up all the payments according to the pri priority payments listed that you see on page two. Now the priority payments don't necessarily come on the time schedule as referenced in that schedule. So we would see what money's come in. So we don't know uh, when education would be impacted. We don't know when uh, our obligations are for debt service. And then if we, in the fact if that if we do issue an IOU, uh, that screws up all the payments, right? Because then we would go to the registered warrants. Uh, the treasurer would identify how much money on a daily basis uh, we would have in the state treasury. We would engage in litigation. So let's say the a vendor does not get paid for the particular month. The, oh, during that next month, we would have to make sure that we pay that particular vendor first uh, if there's sufficient monies in the treasury, and then we would see which priority payment would come up and then start to make those bills. There would be significant disruption in the, the remainder of the markets in California as to how people would budget. Schools wouldn't know how to budget. Special districts wouldn't know how to budget. Private sector vendors would know how to budget. Anybody impacted by state monies uh, would go into cash flow uh, considerations. Assemblymember De Leon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mr. Lockyer, what's our current short term and long term credit bond ratings with uh, Moody's, and, Moody's and Fitch and Standard and Poor's? And also, to the issue that we've talked about with RAS, the revenue anticipation warrants. How realistic is it if we run out of cash come March, if we're on fumes in late February, we run out of cash in March, how realistic is it do we trigger any warrants with the credit uh, weakened markets right now, lack of liquidity? And if we go to registered warrants, what are we actually looking at with regards to our credit fiscal health for the state of California? Well, the uh, assembly the state is currently uh, the lowest rated state uh, tied with Louisiana in terms of our credit rating. Now many of us think that's unfair, but that's our current rating. And because of our deteriorating budget and fiscal situation, we could be downgraded further soon. Uh, hopefully the legislature will act in a way that will avoid that and maybe at some point if we have balanced budgets uh, for some number of years we can be upgraded. What that mostly means is the cost of borrowing that we do every year even in good years, the cost of borrowing to meet the ca cash flow needs during the uh, low income months, low revenue months goes up probably the cost of the delay this last summer, if we had had a budget adopted during the summer, that delay probably added 60 or 70 million dollars to the cost of the short-term borrowing we did two months ago. Yeah, it that much more. Well, you could do a lot with 60 million dollars. And uh, that's what we're looking at down the road unless these uh, numbers stabilize. Senator Harmon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this question for the LAO. I wanted to focus on the uh, California Performance Review, which was completed uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe it's like 2,700 pages long, completed by two or 300 state employees. 
Would it make any sense to revisit some of the suggestions and ideas in the California Performance Review and try to uh, realize some savings uh, from those suggestions? And if so, what dollar amount do you think that might compute to in savings that we might realize if those ideas were adopted? I think it's absolutely appropriate to go back to that document. Uh, we also, our office put out a rather extensive report on it in 2005 that you can find by going to our website. But even if you adopted all of their recommendations, the general fund savings yearly was only a little bit more than $2 billion. So again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go there. They had a lot of good ideas. You know, one of them was to consolidate the uh, tax agencies, an idea that our office put on the table for the first time back in 1945, I think. So there's been a lot of ideas out that have been around for a long time. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't revisit them. A lot of them were good ideas because they resulted in better service to taxpayers or better efficiencies. So yes, absolutely, I think we should look at those and all sorts of other ideas that people can put on the table that may not get savings right now, but can help us down the road. So I would say the answer to that is definitely yes. Assemblymember Huber. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This question is for Mr. Taylor. Um, we've heard a lot about the negative impacts of tax increases. I believe I've heard Mr. Genest's opinion on that. Could you speak to uh, your opinion on the negative effects to the current economy if we were to raise tax revenues? And also, uh, the corollary to that, what impact would it have on today's economy if we were to adopt severe spending cuts? Well, I think the answer is generally the same to both, that they have negative effects, either taking money out of the hands of local governments or beneficiaries, you're taking the money out of the hands of taxpayers. The state, as a state, does not have the ability, I think as was referenced by one of our speakers, to do macroeconomic policy. We can't deficit spend, we can't print money. Anything you do to close your budget almost by definition, will not have a positive effect on the economy. It will have a negative effect. But you have to close the gap. You have to have a balanced budget. And I think that's why it's important to look at these other factors that people have talked about on the stimulus to at least do your best by getting your bond funds out, putting people back to work, getting, taking advantage of the capacity that exists out there in our construction industry to put people back to work on projects that are scheduled to be done and if we can do them sooner, that just saves the state money, puts people to work, gets the projects done at a far less cost than if we wait two or three years. So I think your options are relatively limited in what you can do to stimulate the economy, because most of what you'll do, whether it's done through spending reductions or tax cuts, will have a negative effect. Thank you. Uh, the Senate Budget Chair. Ms. Mr. Pro Tem, could I add yes. quickly? It's spending that's going to occur, whether it's on the private sector or the public sector. If you tax more, you spend more on the public sector. It doesn't go away mysteriously. It's still in the economy. So it's a question of where the spending will occur. It, doesn't, it, it has bad effects on both sides of the equation, but it's neutral if you look at it holistically. Sorry. Senator Cheney. Um. Thank you all very much. I have a couple questions that follow up. One, one specifically for the controller um, on if you can talk a little bit about what happened last summer. We did a lot of cash deferrals in last year's budget um, and how that affected the agencies and folks that did it and how much do those things cost. I think you know one of the themes that runs throughout this um, is sort of opportunity costs. I think that, that goes to the last question and, um, and, and I think that the, the most ironic part of this entire discussion, always starting last summer, has been um, the fact that the, the more the economy melts down, the greater the need for the services is. The, the unemployment number cited from, from the Central Valley um, means caseload goes up in CalWORKs, in Medi-Cal, in, um, you know, in universities. There's a cost to, to businesses of students not being able to complete their courses um, in four years or five years or six or seven years at universities. Um, the, the opportunity costs, and I don't know that anybody can speak directly to it today, but I think it's something we need some help with over the next few days as, as we go through subcommittees. Um, and I just wanted some clarity on actual revenues and maybe finance and LAO, but 
people were throwing some numbers around from 97 and 2000, and I think it's important for us to, we have all these percentages and what grows and what doesn't. The reality of what's the real number. I mean, I think what we're seeing is, is the reduction in revenues this year from what we thought it was going to be last July or last September um, takes us back to what number? Because I think my guess, and I don't, I, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Janess probably has this. It, it, it's 90, it's 2005 general fund, it's 2006 general fund. I think we have to get realistic about how much we're going down here um, from, from this economic crisis. So if, if people can give us the real numbers, um, we appreciate that. And any thoughts uh, Mr. Lockyer might have on the overall financial meltdown and will we be able to go to the credit markets, even if we've done something, how hard is it going to be to get to restart our ability to borrow um, if, if in nine days you stop projects and then we have to restart them? What, what does that cost us? State Treasurer, briefly, please. Well, if we can get, if there's a balanced budget, we can probably get back in the market and borrow for these infrastructure needs. We won't know until we try. But we know we can't do it without an honestly balanced budget. Oh, go ahead, Controller Chung. Uh, Senator, and then regarding your question in regards to the uh, cash, uh, ca cash deferrals have led us to this very problem. Uh, if you look at what we did earlier this decade when we passed the economic recovery bonds, uh, we, we went out for a raw because we were, were not able uh, to secure the bonding that we, uh, the uh, bond, uh, the, the barbels that were required. Uh, we didn't have the cash and budget solutions in place, and then we had to go out for an extraordinary borrowing, which today we are prohibited from, by law from doing. We don't have that backstop that was available to us just six years ago. Uh, cash def remember, cash is a symptom of a budget. Uh, so if we're going to solve a cash solution, it does not preserve our ability to move out of the problem for the long term. So our immediate focus is what do we do about the $28 billion deficit? Fixing the $28 billion deficit will ultimately resolve itself in a healthy cash system because, as Bill just alluded to, we should have the ability in the external markets to secure the borrowing that we, that we do need. Senator Cheney, just, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but as I said in my presentation, we had spending of about $103 billion in both 2007, 8 and 8, 9. Uh, the revenue drop-off is so dramatic that we don't forecast that we will have revenues of that level, that is in excess of $103 billion, until 2013, 14. Senator Cheney, I, uh, we're looking for the exact number, but because we were trying to subtract out all the different solutions that were done that involved revenue in the Budget Act and the ones that we're proposing in this session. But we think it's, it's something like 89 or 87 billion dollars is our, is our regular revenue if we hadn't done anything yet and we weren't going to do anything more. And so if you look back to 2004-05, the state's revenue general fund was 82. If you look back to 2005-06, the revenue was 93. You'll note that's a very large increase that those were boom years. It was only a few years back. Uh, so I don't know whether it's appropriate to say we're back three years or four years, but we've essentially lost something like that in our, in our growth and our revenue. Uh, Assemblymember Jeffries. Um, this question's for Mac. Um, I guess first I want to slightly disagree with some of the assumptions that were made here, here earlier. I mean, I, first off, I'd I don't believe that government can spend our money more effectively than we can personally. I think there's a declining return as we take money from the private sector and put it into government. I, th I think that ultimately harms the, ult the recovery this state needs to see. Uh, what I want to ask from you is because we, we had some good questions earlier about which taxes do we need to look <coughs> at, and every tax seems to be agreed upon up there that is going to have a very negative impact or a potential negative impact. Uh, the BOE said um, that a 1 percent sales tax increase results in the equivalent of a 60,000 60, job loss and uh, over $600 million in business question, investment question. decline. Do you have a ranking 
of the order of taxes that will do the least amount of damage to the state economy. Which tax, if you were going to look at one, which one would you look at first because it will, it will not impact the private sector and job losses versus which ones will work better, if there is such a thing? Uh, we do not have that information, Assemblyman Jeffries. I, I don't, I'm sure we could uh, talk with some, several economists to see what they would suggest. Uh, ultimately, any tax that you pick will have some job losses associated with it. There's, there's no question about that. Uh, we also think that in addition to just that factor, you should look at other things, such as kind of good tax policy. One reason that we put on the table, it wasn't recommendation, but an option of increasing the VLF to 1%. Not, not back up to its 2 percent level that we had for many years, but back up to 1 percent, but because we felt that was a reasonable, from a tax policy basis, to tax this type of personal property, your cars, at the same rate as we tax all other property under Proposition 13. So you're, you're in a tough position. We can certainly look at that and get back to you if we find anything. But I think you're going you're gonna to find that they all generate losses. It's going to be a lot of judgment involved. And you just have to kind of balance a whole lot of things, as we tried to do when we commented on the taxes that the administration has, had proposed. May, may I also point out that um, the Speaker has suggested and the Governor has uh, uh, recently announced that he plans to form a commission to look at uh, the tax policy of the state from a revenue, neut revenue neutral perspective with the idea that our taxes are obviously too volatile, our revenues go up and down. Uh, much more than our economy does, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, and it makes budgeting much more difficult for you all. Um, plus, we could probably come up with, if we, and we're going to have a lot of great economists and lots of uh, good input on this, a, a better tax system than the one we have now or the one that we'll have if you adopt everything we've proposed that would do a better job of encouraging business formation, job growth, et cetera. So that's out there in the future, but not too far. The governor has asked the commission to return its recommendations by April 15th. 